met at Colorado State back when we were both in grad school, I guess 11 or so years ago. Uh, then with his work with um, uh, Farm Forward, a little bit of interaction when I was at Binghamton. Uh, so he mostly is, let's see, he works uh, as program coordinator for Farm Forward and his research, he does uh, philosophy of food, medicine, and animals, as well as environmental philosophy, uh, mostly focused through a hermeneutic lens, as well as pragmatist and Jainist perspectives. Um, in his, on the practical side, he's worked with Farm Forward um, on a bunch of different educational and uh, research projects. The lead project with Farm Forward is the annual webinar event with uh, Jonathan Safran Foyer, author of Eating Animals and We Are the Weather. Um, as a personal aside, I'm very happy that he's finally here. This has been in the works since September 2019 uh, to prep for Earth Week for 2020, but as we all know, the, the fit hit the shan that year uh, and things have been slowly rebuilding and now that we're opening back up once again, uh, here he is. So uh, please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Thanks, Joel. Yay, finally. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for having me, and I'm, I'm grateful to be here, um, and I'm looking forward to talking with y'all. <clears throat> so this is really a kind of reflection on how I got involved with advocacy, uh, starting with my interest in philosophy, um, and then also talking about some specific campaigns that I've worked on um, and some details regarding those. Um, so I actually have a long history with Louisiana in general um, because I grew up here actually in the Opelousas area in St. Landry Parish and left for a decade for grad school and teaching in Colorado and Texas and Oregon. Uh, and then a few years ago or several years ago, um, I ended up getting this job at McNeese State in Lake Charles, which brought me back after leaving for about a decade. Um, so I was an undergrad in philosophy at University of Louisiana Lafayette. Um, and my training there was sort of the standard mainstream or what we might call like the analytical tradition or analytic tradition in philosophy uh, with a big emphasis on philosophy of mind. We had a COGSI doctoral program there at the time. Um, and so I didn't really get into animal and environmental ethics until graduate school. And uh, I happened to get into Colorado State in Fort Collins and it just so happened to be a really good place to study animal and environmental ethics. Um, it had some of the founders of those fields there, um, Holmes Ralston and environmental ethics, and then my master's advisor, Bernie Rowland. Um, and so I had this natural proclivity, like a lot of philosophers do, to question things that we take for granted on an everyday basis. I just hadn't really applied that sort of uh, reasoning to food issues yet. Um, but as I, and honestly, just something as simple as like watching the documentary Food Inc. when that came out was really transformative for me and really in, in influenced me to look further into the hidden aspects of where our food comes from and how it's made, right? Um, <clears throat> so um, Bernie Rowland introduced, and I can, I can just read some of this, please don't feel pressured to read all of this, but um, among his many contributions to animal ethics, Bernie Rowland introduced this concept of telos, which he's taking from the ancient philosopher Aristotle, but applying specifically in the context of animal ethics. So telos um, basically meaning uh, like a directedness, um, or in this case, like a set of capacities, um, or like he puts it, the pigness of the pig, the dogness of the dog, right, is the basis for his animal ethics, right? So he says, Thus, an adequate morality towards animals should address not only pleasure and pain, but the full range of possible matterings following from animals' natures. When we evaluate, for example, gestation crates for sounds, we must compare them to what a sound does in nature when she actualizes her telos, covering a mile a day, rooting and foraging, nest building, all of which are behaviors impossible to perform in a crate. Right? And so this uh, really got me thinking on how I can try to put my interest in ethics into practice. Um, and so at the same time, after my first semester of grad school, I was heading back home and I was in the Denver airport looking for a book to take on the flight. And I came across Eating Animals by Jonathan Safran Foer. And I, um, you may be familiar with him uh, in the world of fiction. He's quite popular. He wrote extremely loud and incredibly close, uh, and several other novels. And this was a nonfiction 
book that he wrote in 2009, uh, specifically about his own personal journey kind of oscillating throughout his life between like vegetarianism and meat eating and this sort of importance of embracing imperfection while trying to, to do our best um, to make the world a better place. Um, but I didn't know anything about it at the time. It just really popped out at me. You know, he has these very stylish covers, for instance. So I picked it up, I read it, I devoured it in just a couple of days. Uh, and sat with that for a while, you know, as I continued my education. Um, and so then, about a year later, um, well, as I was working on my master's thesis, Bernie Rowland, my advisor, um, contacted me and asked me if I wanted to be involved with um, an animal ethics uh, advocacy group, um, Form Forward, which I'll get into in a moment. But um, I found out that he was on their board of directors and they had contacted him to see if he knew of any grad students that would want to help out with research projects. Uh, and so he recommended me to them and we did a phone interview and I thought their name sounded really familiar. I was like, God, this is weird. Uh, and so I went back to eating animals and saw that the organization I was interviewing for was actually the organization that was featured um, in the book. And I was like, God, oh, that's you know, it's just like this real interesting moment of serendipity for me um, that's had like really profound impacts on the trajectory of my life. So it's been interesting to, uh, to reflect on that. Um, so I got involved with Form Forward in 2011. Um, and so Form Forward is really, it's a nonprofit advocacy group um, with its, its central goal focused on ending factory farming specifically, right, or industrial animal agriculture. Um, and so it says here, we're a team of strategists, campaigners, and thought leaders guiding the movement to change the way our world eats and forms, right? So they look at that in three different categories. So there's changing forming, uh, and in that realm, they've had a big focus on pre-industrial or heritage breeds of poultry and consultation with heritage poultry farmers. Um, because one thing that Farm Forward has done to distinguish itself is really raise a lot of awareness about the importance of genetic welfare, uh, which had previously really been overlooked within animal advocacy. And the idea being that, uh, you know, there are, there are <clears throat> uh, broilers and layers, right, are the two main categories of chickens in factory farming, those that are bred for their flesh and those that are bred for their eggs, right? Uh, they've been selectively bred for generations to be as productive as possible, to produce as much uh, meat or eggs as possible, and this selective breeding over time, right? And honestly, factory farming is also really a mid-20th century phenomenon, right? It, the very existence of industrial animal agriculture is pretty recent. It's largely post-World War II. Um, <clears throat> so this selective breeding for productivity creates a lot of muscular and skeletal problems basically as a result. Uh, and so while it's important to think about the environment in which animals exist, um, even if modern day uh, broilers and layers were placed in the most optimal environment possible, they would still endure a large amount of suffering because of the way that they've been selectively bred over time. Um, so this is really, to me, a, a major contribution that the organization has made. Um, another category of their work involves changing policy. Um, so advocating an acute reduction in the consumption of factory formed meat, fish, eggs, and dairy by encouraging conscientious consumer and institutional decision making. And I'll get more into this whenever I, I talk about one of the campaigns I've been focused on recently uh, in the second half of the presentation, uh, focused on implementing plant-based defaults in institutional settings. Um, but we also focus on building coalitions with other groups um, and trying to work towards uh, shifting policy, right? Um, and then changing narratives, which is really where I, I kind of first got involved uh, in terms of particular projects and campaigns that I was helping out with, right? Supporting interdisciplinary research and undergraduate teaching about the cultural significance of animals and animal agriculture and then you know, trying to basically facilitate the production of essays, books, films, and religious activities. And I will say that as far as animal advocacy groups go, we're a very education-oriented and a very multi-faith-oriented group. Our CEO and founder, Aaron Gross, is a professor of religious studies at the University of San Diego, focusing on 
uh, Judaism and animal ethics specifically. Um, but we also have, as part of this work towards changing the narrative, we have a faith and food fellowship program where we provide funding and support for people who are uh, producing books dealing with the intersection of religion and animal ethics. Um, so we've had a couple so far. One of them is David Clough at, I think, the University of Westchester in the UK, uh, who wrote a two-volume series called On Animals. And then we also have um, the Reverend Dr. Christopher Carter, um, who's also a religious studies professor at University of San Diego, um, and we, we helped support the, uh, his work on the book, uh, The Spirit of Soul Food, which just came out in November or December. I highly recommend it. I, I actually, uh, I lead a staff book club for Farm Forward, and that's the book that we're working through now. And it's, he really uh, does a wonderful job is of tracing the history of um, African agricultural and culinary methods um, through the, the development of, and coining of the concept of soul food, but also looking at the sort of plant-based origins of a lot of African uh, culinary traditions. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's actually a wonderful book. Um, <clears throat> so um, the first project that I worked on with them was actually consultation with the ASPCA. Um, they were starting to get more interested in having very specific positions about uh, farm animal welfare. So, you know, historically the ASPCA has largely been involved uh, in companion animal efforts. Um, <clears throat> so they basically hired Farm Forward as consultants, and so my first task with them was basically creating a bunch of lit reviews, doing an making annotated bibliographies of animal science literature, and animal welfare literature, uh, looking at very specific practices, like in this case, debeaking of chickens and turkeys, and analyzing the information that was out there um, in terms of which methods are uh, more or less humane. Sometimes it's based on measuring cortisol or stress levels in the animals. Uh, and saying, you know, having, having a multi-tiered position that we suggest to them, right, uh, which is that, you know, debeaking can be made unnecessary through selective breeding, right? A lot of this is, you know, feather pecking and cannibalism uh, are often exacerbated through overcrowding, for instance, right? Um, there are a bunch of other factors that, um, you know, lead to debeaking being a, a treatment of a, a symptom rather than looking at the underlying cause of the problem. Um, so we would say, like, you know, debeaking isn't really a good thing to do, but given that it's going to continue, we could say that, like, laser debeaking is technically higher welfare than hot blade uh, amputation, right? So I was kind of cultivating, developing these specific positions to recommend to the ASPCA. Uh, and then another major project, which is really still the lead project that I have with them, is the Jonathan Safran Thor virtual visit series. Um, so we started in uh, 2012, and we've had over 20,000 people take part uh, over the past decade. It's a mostly annual event. Every now and then we'll skip a year. Um, but it's really a series of conversations with largely students, but anyone can attend. Uh, and Jonathan, who's the author of Eating Animals that I mentioned before. Um, and really the, the crux of, of Jonathan's approach and our approach to inform forward to advocacy is to invite people into conversation, not to alienate people. Um, and so that's really what we try to cultivate in these events. Um, and I really was just kind of handed this, this somewhat abstract idea in uh, early 2012, just a few months after I had started working with Form Forward, they were saying, Jonathan, we have Jonathan booked for this particular date in October or something like that, uh, and we want to do some kind of virtual event. So they were like, here, make this happen, figure that out. And so I spent a lot of time kind of like creating the infrastructure for it, figuring out the best avenues of promotion, um, and really kind of developing that project from the ground up. Um, and so we, we might do one this year if I can get in touch with them, <laughs> but it's typically an annual event and it's gone very well. Um, so about four or five years ago, we started a sister organization called Better Food Foundation. Uh, we refer to it as a sister organization specifically because um, 
there, so there are a variety of different structural approaches to nonprofit funding, right? Um, we're, we're a small group. I would say there are 15, around 15 full-time employees. And I'm, you know, I'm a professor, so I'm doing this part-time. Uh, I was doing a part-time in graduate school as well. Um, but we're a small group. So giant organizations like uh, Humane Society of the United States or People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals uh, are, are much more adept at relying on small donors, basically, um, because they are able to get the word out in a way that, you know, we're not. Um, so we end up being reliant ultimately on like a small amount of like billionaires <laughs> that are just really believe in what we're doing. <laughs> Dr. Bronner's is also one of our major donors. Um, and so they sometimes send us soap, which is great. Um, but um, <clears throat> One of our donors basically gave us a sum of money that was earmarked for use for specifically promotion of, of plant-based eating, okay? And so to make sure that this money was only funneled into this specific set of campaigns, we created a sub-organization, just to clarify. Um, so that's the Better Food Foundation. Uh, it has much of the same staff, um, but slightly different focus, and um, the mission of the Better Food Foundation is to promote dietary changes to build a healthy, equitable, humane, and environmentally sustainable food system. We work to support values-based food choices through policy change, advocacy, resource development, and grant making. Uh, and so the main campaign that I have helped out with, um, and we're still a relatively new organization, um, so there's just, you know, kind of a few major things that we do. One of them is providing funding and support um, for different veg fests, like the Black Veg Fest in Maryland and things like that. Um, so Greener by Default is the main campaign that I've worked on with them. Uh, I started doing that about two and a half years ago. Um, <clears throat> so I'll talk about it more, but it, it is basically the idea of implementing plant-based defaults anywhere that food is served, okay? Uh, and so I'll start off by giving just a little bit of background about the environmental impacts of factory farming, um, because while people are becoming more aware of that, it is um, really just starting to emerge in the public conscience, I think. Um, like the film Cowspiracy some time ago helped to increase interest in those relationships, but like historically, it, you know, the environmental movement has not placed heavy emphasis on um, factory farming or industrial animal agriculture. Um, so I start off with a quote from uh, the environmental scientist Jonathan Foley. When we think about threats to the environment, we tend to picture cars and smokestacks, not dinner. But the truth is our need for food poses one of the biggest dangers to the planet. <clears throat> so globally, animal agriculture uses 77% of all farmland and produces 57% of all food associated greenhouse gas emissions, but produces only 18% of the world's protein and calories. <clears throat> so here you can see, this is beef, lamb, cheese, prawns, pork, poultry, nuts, tofu, peas, lentils. Sorry, that's very small. Uh, so you can see the carbon footprints of different food items, right? So the most carbon intensive foods are animal products. You can see that tending down as we move into nuts, tofu, peas, and lentils. So chicken is often promoted as a sustainable meat, and its carbon footprint is certainly much lower than beef, lamb, and cheese, but chicken's carbon footprint, uh, footprint is still 11 times greater than lentils and beans. <clears throat> so in our everyday lives, we only see a very small part of the food system, right? So this is the tip of the iceberg. The part of the iceberg that's above the water line which in the case of food involves our individual food and water consumption and food waste. Food starts at the grocery store or restaurant, as far as you know, most people are cognizant. Meat corporations don't want people to think about what lies below the water line. All of the resources required to feed the 10 billion animals raised for food every year. All of the deforestation and water and air pollution caused by those animals. One of the major problems with animal agriculture is that it's very inefficient. For every 100 calories of corn and soy we feed to a cow, we get back only three calories of meat. So it takes tremendous amounts of land to feed the nine billion animals <clears throat> raised for food in the US each year. 
So the huge yellow square in the middle, the largest single use of land, is grazing land for cattle. This extends far beyond not natural grasslands and into forests, wetlands, and other ecosystems that have been destroyed in order to create more rangeland. To the lower right of that yellow square, you see a square with all the land used to grow livestock feed, <clears throat> corn and soy fed to animals on factory farms. And above that, less than half of the amount of land is dedicated to all the rest of the food that we eat. All the grains, vegetables, fruits, and legumes. Studies have shown that if we use the land currently dedicated to growing corn and soy for animals to grow food for people, we could feed an additional 800 million people. Land use for animal agriculture is not just a problem in the US. The leading cause of the Amazon rainforest being cut down is to make grazing land for beef cattle and to grow corn and soy to feed to animals on factory farms. Because they're so resource intensive and inefficient, animal products have much bigger environmental footprints than plant-based products. In this infographic from the New York Times, you can see the carbon, land, and water footprint of cow milk compared to different types of plant-based milks. Even al almond milk has a much smaller water footprint than cow milk, though soy and oat are the most sustainable overall. <clears throat> One study found that together, the top five meat and dairy corporations are actually responsible for more greenhouse gas emissions than Exxon, Mobil, Shell, or BP on their own, right? Not combined for this section. And yet we almost never hear about the environmental impacts of animal agriculture, mostly with an emphasis on fossil fuels. And that's intentional. Big meat corporations spend a larger percentage of their revenue on funding climate denialism and blocking climate legislation than big oil. They want to keep consumers in the dark about the impacts of their food choices and to escape any legal responsibility. Um, and then we have some glimpses into the particular things that they don't want you to see, right? Like manure lagoons, right? So environmental racism is a, um, it's very prevalent within the system of industrial animal agriculture. So um, I don't know if y'all are familiar with the scholarship and grassroots movement of environmental justice, but focusing on how environmental uh, burdens are often disproportionately placed on particular communities, often historically marginalized groups, right? Um, and if y'all are familiar with Cancer Alley in St. James Parish, for example, that's often cited as an example of a major, you know, like series of environmental injustices because of the amount of petrochemical plants there and the abnormally high cancer rates there. Um, and so um, largely the environmental justice movement has focused on um, toxic waste, for instance, uh, petrochemical facilities and the correlation between those and cancer rates. Um, but there is much to be said about the relationship between factory farming and environmental injustices, right? And so, for instance, um, many hog farms in North Carolina, as an example, are created in uh, historically black communities, which often leads to a variety of health issues such as asthma, cancer, the devaluation of real estate as well as another practical consequence. And so it's important to keep these in mind as well. Um, <clears throat> so once you see those manure lagoons, it's not hard to imagine them leaching into groundwater. In fact, manure runoff from factory farms is a leading cause of water pollution in the U.S. There are often impacts on the workers themselves within factory farms, right? It's considered the most dangerous job in the nation. Uh, Tyson averages one amputation per month. And we, we also saw this play out during the pandemic in terms of the way that workers were treated. Um, <clears throat> forced to wear diapers, exposed to dangerous chemicals and pathogens. They often develop PTSD. They also have a high turnover rate, because of, often because of the psychological impacts of working in these facilities. Uh, many of the workers are undocumented, meaning that they often have no health insurance or no protection from sexual assault and wage theft. <clears throat> so several studies published in peer-reviewed journals have found that we can't keep climate change under control if we continue our diets as usual. Even if every other sector, energy, transportation, buildings, became completely carbon neutral by 2050, but we left the food system unchanged, the food system alone would cause us to fail to meet the Paris Climate Accord. 
Luckily, there's a simple and accessible solution, or I think a viable path forward. Um, greenhouse gas emissions of plant-based meals are on average 63% lower than the emissions of animal-based meals. This study examined different sustainability interventions for events, and so this is kind of getting into the specific campaign of greener by default, such as conferences or meetings. They found that by far the most impactful intervention was switching from beef to veggie burgers, followed by reducing the portion size of beef by 25%. Other interventions that we commonly think of as ways to go green, like using recycled plastic or eliminating single-use plastic within the study, uh, had a significantly smaller impact on the carbon footprint of an event in comparison. <clears throat> so how do we encourage this shift? Our program, so greener by default, uh, the implementation of plant-based defaults was inspired by the book Nudge and largely by Nudge theory within behavioral economics. Um, so this particular book, and it's really been popularized a lot by these authors, Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein, uh, where they examine the profound impacts of defaults and nudges on human behavior. So a default is the option people end up with if they don't make an active choice. People tend to stick with the default or the status quo, partly because it's one less decision to make, partly because it's seen as the more socially acceptable option. People don't like going against the grain. So one of the most talked about examples, oh, there's a quote. One of the most talked about examples of the power of defaults is organ donation. In Germany, where people are by default not organ donors and must actively opt in, the participation rate is about 12%. In Austria, which is relatively culturally similar to Germany, people by default are organ donors and must actively opt out. Their participation rate is 99%, which means they're saving many, many more lives. So basically, what we're doing for this campaign is, is modeling this sort of nudge theory and applying this uh, idea of uh, defaults to the way that food is served in institutional settings. Um, <clears throat> so. When you combine plant-based foods and defaults, you get greener by default. The concept is simple, which is just rather than having meat as the default and making people opt into plant-based foods, make plant-based the default and give people the choice to opt into meat or other animal products. Okay, so it's, um, you know, it's different even from a campaign like Green Monday, right? Uh, where on one day of the week, there is maybe only plant-based options available um, because this isn't, this is not interfering with anyone's freedom of choice, right? <clears throat> so it's flexible. It can be implemented in any environment where food is served, right? It's not even necessarily something that has to happen in dining halls specifically, right? It could be catering for meetings, uh, events, conferences, clubs, you know, anything of that nature, right? It's cost neutral and can even save money, right? <clears throat> it's also more inclusive. So, Having to request special accommodations rather than being able to just sit down and enjoy a meal with coworkers can be alienating. Serving plant-based foods with the option to add meat and dairy includes everyone by default. It includes the 30 to 50 million Americans who are lactose intolerant, the majority of whom are people of color. It includes Buddhists, Hindus, Jains, Sikhs, Rastafarians, Seventh-day Adventists, and you know, more who may be vegetarian, Jews and Muslims who don't eat pork, it also includes young people who are eating more plant-based foods and communities of color. Black Americans are actually twice as likely to be vegan as white Americans, and a third of Americans of color reported reducing their meat consumption in the past year compared to a quarter of Americans overall. <clears throat> so we've been gathering research on the implementation of defaults. We're also piloting our own research right now. Um, through Stanford, UCLA, Harvard, and several other institutions. So actually, like, if that's something that Loyola would be interested in being involved in, you know, I would be happy to connect y'all with people who are coordinating those studies. Um, but we also, we have some data, which you can see more extensively on our website, greenerbydefault.com, um, and I'll present a little bit here. Um, so this study at Harvard University's Kennedy School implemented a vegetarian default at a conference as an experiment. In the control setting, meat was the default and people could opt into a veg option. When meat is the default, 75% of people stuck with meat. When they reversed it so that the vegetarian option was the default, 
two-thirds of people stuck with the vegetarian default and one-third opted into meat. So this resulted in a 43% increase in the amount of vegetarian meals served. And then a study in Denmark had even more dramatic results. Um, in their control condition, 98% of people stuck with the meat default and only 2% requested vegetarian. When veg was the default, 87% of people stuck with veg and 12% opted into meat, an 80% increase in vegetarian meals served. <clears throat> so I can also talk about some specific strategies as examples for how this might be implemented you know, in real world contexts. Um, so <clears throat> the best way to implement it is to make the base of the meal plant-based. right? Um, so for buffets and family style settings, you can offer meat and dairy at the end of the line, right? Um, for RSVP meals, you could state that the food will be plant-based by default and offer a box to check if guests would like to opt into meat, similar to the way where often when you're RSVPing at events, you have to check if you want the vegetarian or vegan option, right? So it's really just turning that on its head in a way, right? Not denying people's freedom to opt into the sort of meal they would like to eat, but also just shifting what the default meal is going to be if people don't indicate otherwise, right? <clears throat> So <clears throat> when it's not possible to make the base meal entirely plant-based, you can also uh, create the perception that plant-based is the default by basically increasing the ratio of plant-based to animal-based options. Right. Um, so a University of Cambridge study found that increasing the ratio from one to three to two to two increased the take rate of veg options by 60%. Also a recent study found that when three-fourths of the options are meat-based, 12% of people choose the veg option. But when three-fourths of the options are vegetarian, 48% choose the veg option. Right. Um, you can also make subtle substitutions. So we saw, for instance, at UCLA recently, uh, and UCLA has been an interesting case study for us because um, one of the challenges with implementing this sort of campaign in a dining hall setting, as y'all might be aware if y'all have tried to work with food service, um, most universities contract with a few different companies, right? It's Sodexo, Bon Appetit, um, Chartwells, right, is what we use at McNeese. Um, and so they are often beholden to the decisions made by people higher up in the organization. And so a lot of the, like a lot of the students that I work with and supervise who are working on this campaign, like their first idea, which feels very straightforward and impactful to them, is to try to implement this in dining halls. Um, and it rarely really works out with a lot of success. Um, usually, whenever we meet with people, you know, and even though they're well-intentioned, you know, they usually just end up emphasizing what options are already there and not necessarily trying to have the default offerings challenged. Um, but UCLA has been interesting for us because they're one of the universities that actually doesn't contract with a larger company. They coordinate all of their own dining themselves. Um, so they're able to make changes uh, more easily, right? They're not necessarily beholden to the decisions of like, um, you know, people that are higher up in the company. Um, so for instance, they, we saw them incorporate a vegan brownie, right? Um, and we saw that when they piloted it, they found that students actually preferred it in taste tests. It was also cheaper to make, more people could eat it, and it had a lower carbon and water footprint, right? I think they also, they make their own hamburger buns from scratch, so they, they subbed um, plant-based butter instead of uh, regular butter, right? And there are a lot of things like that in food service where people can't, you know, like whenever it's just like baked into something where they especially aren't gonna be able to tell the difference. Um, so I have a couple of examples here of some of the uh, successes that we've had so far. Um, and so again, this can be implemented anywhere that food is served, right? So any context where people are eating food could be, um, greener by default or could have plant-based defaults, right? Um, so we've had some sustainability offices at universities adopt this. So this is the wording uh, from NYU's Office of Sustainability website. Um, <clears throat> so they mention it right here. Um, Harvard's Office of Sustainability has also implemented plant-based defaults and they've included that in their recommendations for other on-campus organizations. Like they have a, um, a PDF of uh, tips for sustainable event coordination, right, where they encourage plant-based defaults. 
Um, <clears throat> so there's also a variety of different departments and colleges, like the Huxley College of the Environment at Western Washington University, um, the uh, Oxford U Hero Center for Practical Ethics at Oxford University recently adopted it. Um, so you know, a lot of what, what I'm doing, like in my everyday work on this campaign, is reaching out to people, um, and we also have a we have an ambassador program for people who are interested in a volunteer position working on this with us because it works well when you start with where you're at, right? If we're just you know a few people cold calling, you know staff at a organization that we don't even know, right? That's extremely different from someone who's already embedded within that organization. Uh, or institution, right? So we really encourage people to think about the connections they already have um, to food and the service of food. Um, <clears throat> we also have a pilot study that's ongoing right now but has shown um, a good deal of success with Gilder, which is a coffee shop in Portland, Oregon. Um, so this is just a brief description of, of their choice to pilot um, this study. Um, and so Default Veg is just, it's another branding for Greener by Default. They're both focused on plant-based uh, defaults in food service. Um, so they say here, <clears throat> we know that a beverage made with plant-based milk produces less than half the carbon footprint of dairy milk. We decided that having dairy milk as our default no longer aligned with our values and sustainability goals. We have not taken away any options, but have chosen to price our beverages with milk, plant-based and dairy as all the same. Right, so they've actually adjusted their pricing scheme across the board. Um, <clears throat> so when you place an order and don't specify a milk for your beverage, we'll ask if you'd like it made with oat, soy, almond, or dairy. Right. <clears throat> so again, it can work in any food setting. Right. Um, I think a lot of the places where it's been most successful is like organizations, departments, clubs on campuses. Right. Um, if, you're, if you are part of a group that is ordering food for a meeting or event, right, this is something that can be implemented. Right? Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, I, I, there's an organization called the Factory Forming Awareness Coalition um, that has an internship program for students, and they have a variety of tasks that they work on. Oh, still doing good on time. <clears throat> And one of those allows those interns to um, choose a campaign that they can work on as part of their internship. And so Greener by Default is one of the campaigns that they can choose to work on. And so part of my work is supervising those interns. They're all students at different universities. So I've recently worked with students at George Washington University, um, a couple of students at Stanford, you know, a variety of places. Um, and we also try to help people think towards the long-term implementation of plant-based defaults. So like at University of Central Florida, their animal rights club actually has a default veg officer, right? So they have a permanent position as part of their club whose task is to, you know, work on plant-based defaults, you know, within their institutional setting, right? And so we offer a variety of resources. Um, so one-on-one -on -one consultation, guides for implementation, and on our website there are a bunch of one-pagers, and I have some printed up for universities um, if y'all are interested in having one. Um, we have menus and recipes. We provide assistance with sourcing products, right? So a question that commonly comes up is about vendors, right? And sometimes that's gonna be specific to a community, right? Like sometimes students are also already in touch with those vendors that specialize or are able to provide plant-based catering. Um, there's also the the Plant-Based Food Association, which is a, a, a national organization that assists with vendors uh, emphasizing plant-based foods. Um, marketing and education materials. Um, yeah, we also have um, a lot of interest in Canadian universities over the last year or so. And so there are, uh, the sustainability coordinator at University of Victoria um, has been working on, um, you know, she's helped develop like a, a GHG emission calculator, for instance, like, um, so we also can help with impact calculations, um, you know, offer all of these services free of charge. <clears throat> so that wraps up my presentation. Um, I really am grateful for the opportunity to kind of take a step back and reflect on what I do in the world of advocacy. Um, and how I got to that and, you know, what I'm currently working on and, and hope to continue working on for the future. So thank you for your time and I'm happy to talk or answer any questions that you have.
Okay. Anybody else want to go first? <laughs> I've heard that Sodexo is piloting some plant-based um, implementation. I need I would need to look that up, but I also have cards that I can hand out to you so we can stay in touch about it. Because yeah, usually we, we've really shifted our focus away from dining halls because of those, in, those challenges, kind of bureaucratic challenges. Um, but <clears throat> I think, you know, like we always encourage people to start with like, what department are, is affiliated with your major? Or what clubs are you already a part of? And they don't even, obviously, if they're like, you know, if it's environmental studies or if it's a sustainability oriented group uh, or animal rights oriented, those are great. But it could also be, you know, there's, there's a way to make this case for anybody, right? That this is a, it's not a, it, it's not an extremely difficult change to make, but it's one that can be really impactful. Yeah. Well, I'll follow up with them. We asked about um, the mix of going to what you just talked about with the internships. So you're working with students who are interested in, um, in these kinds of issues. And as an academic, as a scholar, you're overseeing some of these internships to guide them. Is that what I understood? Um, through the process of implementing, studying, implementing, figuring out solutions on their own campuses. Yes. So yeah. how, what does that kind of look like? Yeah, and so. In other words, how could we do it here? Oh, well, I'm, I can connect you with the, it, so specifically, it's the Factory Forming Awareness Coalition, the FFAC. They developed this internship. Um, so um, they have a whole program, and this is for, this is all students that are like full time, right? This is something, it's, it is, a, I think it's a paid internship. Um, and so they have like a lot of reading groups on environmental and animal ethics and things like that. They have like a whole curriculum that they have planned within a reasonable, what you can reasonably expect from like a full-time undergraduate student. Um, and so the, the part of that that I focus on is the area where they get to pick a campaign to work on. And one of those campaigns is greener by default. Um, and so I, we have a checklist of suggestions for them to get started brainstorming about ways that they could implement this and we also provide presentations about it to them because there are some ins and outs right there are some questions that will come up as you go through this process so we try to educate them about the details of the campaign as much as possible um, we provide email templates for them and that they can adjust and customize and I you know, I provide feedback on all the communication that they're engaging in with people at their institutions um, and then I often, I can, I've sometimes led meetings, but I also try to help them cultivate the skills to engage and communicate about these issues. So I sometimes attend meetings and try to help them through um, kind of developing those leadership skills. So it's like a combination of the ethical um, aspects, the uh, social side, the natural study, you know, the natural science side, the policy, Things like this implemented yep. on campus, so they're learning a lot yep. of skills, it sounds like. Yep, and the challenges, too. Right. You know, it can be a, <laughs> I was telling Joel about that when we were talking earlier. I'm like, part of what they learn in the process is that it can be slow going and frustrating work, mm -hmm. you know. Yep. Um, and so, if you avoid working with the, um, or the um, companies that work on college campuses, what are these students doing for these internships? I mean, who are they? Approaching, trying to get these changes implemented, or they just started, like you said, where they are trying to get um, within their organizations to order just. Yeah, that that is a wonderful start, I think. Right, if you could get so, like one of the first interns that I supervised was an undergraduate in environmental science at uh, Western Washington University in Bellingham. Uh, and she got the entire College of the Environment there to adopt default veg for all of their um, all of their meetings, conferences, and events that they host. Right, so that means that every catering order that they're putting in is structured in this specific way. But yeah, I'm happy to you know I have cards and some other stuff I can hand out to you. I'm happy to stay in touch and you know follow up with any of that if you're interested. Yeah, yeah and that, that's another question I was going to ask you about is the um, the food inclusivity data that you rattled off. I would love, I mean, I'm guessing yeah. you have those data um, from other people's studies because that to me 
is so telling yep. given the data. Yep. Um, and and yep. thinking of it from that perspective instead of, oh, don't kill animals, you know, yeah. because we, people have tried that for a long time, right. but how it's more inclusive rather than yep. um, the opposite. Yeah. I think, yeah, I'm happy to share that, that, that information. I can actually just, I mean, I can just send this whole slideshow, you know, for maybe Kimberly to distribute or something. But, um, yeah, I mean, when you, it's like I hadn't really thought about it until I started looking into it, right? Because I was thinking about it from first, like, an animal ethics perspective and then an environmental perspective. But also, like, when you think about just the amount of people in the world that are, like, lactose intolerant or that abstain from different animal products for religious or other reasons, right? Um, by like kind of by default, right? This sort of you know plant-based meal is going to be more inclusive, right? Obviously, there are, there are nut allergies and things like that that would need to be considered, you know, in certain cases. But in general, it's it's going to be you know I think by far a more inclusive sort of of diet, yeah. Yeah, Joe. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, farm forward and. Beaking, and I was just sort of curious. Uh, you mentioned the farm forward and the emphasis on genetic health, and with bee beaking specifically, how selective breeding is an option. So, sort of at a really high level, a lot of the recommendations for welfare reform for animals is to basically improve the living conditions so that animals are better off. But some of them, like the Carrie Varner, recommend changing the animals to better fit mm -hmm. living conditions. Yep. And feet, uh, so I'm, I'm not sure just what they have in mind. Is it <clears throat> more rounded beaks or feeding away the beaks? Well, some, some people have really just talked about, like, almost bordering on in vitro meat, but basically, yeah, so, so like, animals breeding animals, animals that have no conscious experience, no basically, experience. right, so not, not sentient. Your, uh, yeah. relationship with, with Rollins and the, the, the teleological framework, I was just sort of curious what you thought about that. Yeah, I always, I always, uh, and you know, I kind of tend to to be pragmatic, but also also interested in the actual philosophical tradition of pragmatism too. And so I, I tend to take like a multi-tiered approach to this. Like I really, there there is something. Um, I guess fundamentally, I don't think that non-human animals exist to serve our purposes, right? I don't think that there's any compelling evidence that they exist for this particular like predefined reason, you know. Um, so, like, I, you know, obviously that, that, that leads me to this, you know, in my personal life, like, veganism. Um, but if things are going to continue, right, in a certain way, I, I do understand the need to control for the, you know, the kind of awful conditions that they're living in. And so, yeah, I could possibly be on board with something kind of weird like that, yeah. And oh, thank you so much. Would be here, but I think you. Well, for one, we just come off of you know great kind sure. of a big thing, but also um, you know people don't want to be challenged on their food practices. It's tough. Especially as in Louisiana. It's tough. Yeah, yeah. That's something that I've been really interested in because I grew up here. You know, yeah. left for a decade and then came back. Uh, you know, having spent a decade like working in animal advocacy. Um, so it's, I've been actually floored with the stuff that's already happening, like in New Orleans, um, sweet soul food, you know, like, like that's an awesome place. Uh, or like we have a, we have like a black owned vegan food truck in Lake Charles and I'm like, who, I don't know if you know of, about Lake Charles, but I'm like, who would have ever thought, you know, <laughs> like it's just, it's amazing. So I'm, I'm actually like, you know, instead of like coming to people and telling them what you're doing is wrong, you have to do something else. Like helping people to think for, yeah, and so I, I still fundamentally approach this as a philosopher, because like, I feel like my task is to help people think for themselves, you know. I want them to, to develop those skills. If they come out with a position that's different from mine, you know, if they're able to critically examine and challenge the things that they take for granted, like, that ultimately matters, you know, a lot to me, so. But I love the whole, the whole nudge idea and the, yeah, vegan by, by default or green by default, and yeah, because, right, as soon as you start criticizing people about their <laughs> food practices, it's just like, ah. Yeah, it's tough. I can see people and so, the title of this, or in your title was great, but just being like, oh, I don't want to deal with being criticized. Yeah. So I don't want to go. Right. <laughs> right, yeah, totally. I don't want to be challenged. Yeah. 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 
there are a lot of sustainability issues with commercial fishing, uh, and you know, bycatch is also a problem, which is the amount of uh, you know animals that weren't intended to be caught that are being caught in nets, for instance. Um, I mean, there's also just like health ramifications of like the amount of plastic or you know mercury or things like that that are often in in seafood as well. Um, so I'm not sure as much. Um, I don't know, Joel. Had you researched this before, seafood specifically? Um, yes, yeah, so like uh, in terms of like food conversion, uh, fish are better than chickens. So yeah. they're pretty much. I mean, because they're cold blood amongst other things. Yeah. Uh, they have less sort of overhead uh, in terms of what they need to process to stay alive. So yeah. They uh, they tend to fare better, not as good as the plant, but they tend right. to fare better. Yeah. So there might be a sort of New Orleans exception. That it's like <laughs> yeah. In terms of meat options, it's certainly right. better. Right. Yeah, it's for sure. I know. There's questions about you know sentience with decapods and that sort of thing. Yeah. But considering how many they're eating, there's a yeah. they're growing in boiling liquids. Yeah. Right. There's all kinds of welfare and environmental issues that are probably a little bit different than the default with yeah. uh, mammals specifically. Right. When I was walking here, I was thinking to myself, I'm going to get a crawfish question. <laughs> like, I totally, I was like, I know I'm going to get a crawfish so question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm like, this is perfect timing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there are obviously, there's um, Sea Shepherd is an organization that's focused on, on like, you know, issues, like ethical issues with uh, commercial fishing, for instance. Um, there are, there is also like, you know, overwhelming evidence that fish feel pain, for instance. There's, there are a couple of books about that. Uh, Braithwaite, and Braithwaite, I think, wrote one of them. Um, so yeah, you know, it's not it's something that I'm as well versed in as land animals, but I, I'm aware that there are some, some issues um, when it comes to like overfishing, for instance, and sustainability as well as welfare. Thanks. Well, I have some, if y'all, I made just enough handouts for everybody here. Perfect. I didn't want to use too much paper, you know, so it would be, but I did make a few of these. So this is just a one pager um, about Greener by Default. With, and we have several on our website, greenerbydefault.com, tailored to different institutions implementing plant-based defaults. Um, so this one is specifically about you. And you know, we also frame things in a pragmatic way, right? So we're talking about how it benefits the bottom line of institutions, um, and you know, a lot of a lot of institutions pay lip service to sustainability, right? And don't always follow through on, on that. Um, so this is a great way to say, like, oh, well, you're interested in sustainability, right? Well, this is a comparable sustainable option. Well, for Adam and, and Dominique, I hope y'all recognize Dr. Camilla's. Um, background literature work that was somebody else's work, but his interest and how he turned that into the work that he's doing and interested in and focused on. I mean, I think that's one thing that students tend to get overwhelmed with. Oh my gosh, you know, there's so much in, in the talk, but it's like, you know, you got to think, then over a long period of time. And, no, yeah. Um, you don't have to do everything. No, you, you can't. The wheel. Yeah, you, you can't, but, you know, when you start, when you spend enough time looking into these things, you'll, you eventually start to have positions and interests that you follow up on. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you all so much. I'm really grateful. Yeah, you know. thank you.